Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thank Andy Ransom for making this happen today. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of my work, which spans about 15 years in the seismic field. Um, I'm also going to cover a little bit about Australian earthquakes. I'm also going to cover a little bit about, well, a lot about my work with an earthquake shake table machine, um, the Allosphere Residency, future projects, and what is art in the early 21st century. Um, so just a warning, um, I have here with me a 110 decibel 12 volt siren. Um, this siren, I'm going to switch it on, but it's interfaced with global earthquakes 3.5 and above and American earthquakes 1 and above. So um, I'm interested in chance. My work has a lot of chance in it, so I'll turn this on. And we have no control over this, so this will go off if we get a global event. <coughs> so you prepared? Okay. <laughs> um, anyone been in an earthquake? Okay, so you all know about earthquakes, you know, wherever you stop, you drop, you cover, and you hold on. Now, um, so we've got, a, how many hands have been in earthquakes here? Okay, great. I love doing this in Australia because, you know, as we know, Australia's not a very active seismic continent. Um, can I ask you to stand up because we're going to simulate an earthquake. Can we all stand up, please? Now, on the count of, on the count of three, I just want you to jump once together. One, two, three. Three. Okay, great. Now on the count of three, I want you to jump five times. One, <laughs> two, three. Great, you can, you can sit down now. <laughs> now if you were in Christchurch, Christchurch last February, February the 21st, that would have continued for about 20 to 25 seconds. So you can imagine what that sort of damage that, that did in a place like Christchurch. And interestingly, that earthquake was one of the highest peak ground accelerations ever recorded. It was running at 2 Gs. So you can imagine that amount of energy running through underneath that city, it just shattered it. It was actually a very moderate earthquake in the scale of earthquakes that just had so much ground acceleration. So it just gives you a bit of an idea about the energy of this, this surface crust that we inhabit. Um, now, seismology, globally, um, look, there, are, there are thousands of sensors monitoring displacement of this crust. Um, globally, we, you know, it's interesting, there's a, there's a global network of what they call the Global Seismic Network, which actually is an array of sensors which cover the globe. And so what I've been very interested in for quite some time now is actually using this data to do things with. And so you get a bit of an idea about how many sensors cover this planet. So what I want to do though is just talk a little bit about now about Australian earthquakes. Because living in Australia, we don't often associate earthquakes with Australia. <coughs> but interesting is a schematic of the Australian continent. Interestingly, the Australian continent is one of the fastest moving continents on the planet. It travels at about seven centimetres per year. It pushes onto the <coughs> Indonesian plate, um, causing earthquakes. Indonesia is the most seismically active area on the planet. Um, and what's, what's important to consider that it's what, we get earthquakes here, occasionally, what we call intraplate earthquakes, intraplate earthquakes. And what they are is they're earthquakes which are not affected by the, the, the plates pushing against each other, but they happen unexpectedly. And I think it's important to consider that we should be aware of earthquakes in this country. And one thing about Australia is we don't have building codes like New Zealand or the US because we don't have earthquakes. But this is a dynamic planet. We are inhabiting a dynamic continent. Now, interestingly, in Australia, it's a bit hard to see, but you see the black dots, the red here. They're actually, this is the Australian Seismic Monitoring Network, which is Geosciences Australia. A couple of interesting things about Australian geosciences. Per capita, there is more sensors in Australia than there is anywhere else in the first world. <coughs> um, the other interesting thing about Australia is that the data coming from sensors in Australia, I can get access, freely access to more data in Australia than I can from the US, which is interesting to think that we're not an actively aware seismic culture. Now, one thing I will highlight too, with fracking emerging in, as, as, a, as an energy source, we will see more earthquakes in Australia in the next decade. 
<clears throat> what I'm particularly interested in, we need to point out now, Australia has a very significant history with seismology, and it actually concerns the Maralinga tests in the 50s with the British. Bruce Bolt from Sydney University, <clears throat> at that time he, he set up an array of sensors to monitor the Maralinga testing, and that's when, when internationally they realised seismology, the field itself, is a useful tool, useful tool for measuring and monitoring nuclear test ban treaty, which still exists today. Bruce Bolt actually went on to run Berkeley Seismological Lab in California. So it's a very interesting significance that those Maralinga tests had great influence in actually recognising the field of seismology. And now I want to talk a little bit about my work with an earthquake shake table. <clears throat> now this earthquake shake table was originally a ready-made. It came from the Earth Exchange Museum in the Rocks. Anyone visit that museum in the 90s? Hmm, interesting. It was a museum which came about as a result of the 1989 Newcastle earthquake. And so it was a, it was a mineral mining museum and they, they spent a lot of money on building this <coughs> hydraulically actuated earthquake shake table. The museum lasted two years. Um, the museum closed. I actually tended for it. I finished a media arts degree at COFA. This was available and I actually had space at the time. So I, I tended for it. It was given to me. So I spent predominantly between 2000 and 2001 re-engineering this machine to make it modular so I could actually transport it, I could actually move it. And that resulted in an exhibition at Artspace in 2002. It was a work called Size Monitor, and here I have sort of pimped up that kind of robotic kind of you know, early 2000 you know, retro. And this is what the installation looked like. So the table itself, it's, it's, it's a five ton machine. It simulates vertical and horizontal motion of earthquakes. Um, and what I did at Artspace is the table ran 24-7 for 23 days, and it was collect connected to global events just 3.5 and above. So it actually only ran for, I think, 63 events, but it ran continuously for those days. I remember Nick Sudis asking me to turn, was it possible to turn the table off in the evenings? And I said, I've come here to turn it on. <laughs> you can't turn the earth off. So I mean, this ran continuously. What was interesting about the installation is that there was actually a breathing circuit. So there's actually air dampening cushion bags underneath the floor panels. And so it was actually breathing, it was constantly breathing. So it was actually about experiencing the moment between earthquakes, which was really interesting. So you actually, it was very rare for anyone to be there and actually experience an earthquake. You were actually there just listening to the earth breathe. So just a bit of a summary, what <clears throat> it was about just connecting a large physical system to a dynamic landscape. And just to give you some idea, so the 54 events ran continuously for 23 days, and that was it. Now after, after that, I looked at a couple of projects. One was Adelaide Festival 2002. That, that was to actually take the table to Maralinga and do a field work with it. The other one was 2004 to take it to Meckering, Western Australia. Western Australia is the most seismically active part of Australia at present. It was again it's a field work. And then I worked for a while with the museum in Napier, New Zealand to actually look at this being a, a permanent installation as, a, as an immersive experience with visual sound and a moving floor. They were unsuccessful in being realised. 2007, I initiated a residency at the US Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California. Um, it was the first artist in residence to, to actually take place in that institution. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. I spent two months there. They gave me an office. Um, I had free access just to roam the halls, halls and get to know geophysicists and seismologists and geologists. Which now, out of the 2007 residency at the US Geological Survey, I realised a work called the Parkfield Interventional Earthquake Fieldwork, which was a large scale, um, it was part machine, part earthwork, part performance. It was a play on the late 60s, early 70s American land art earth movement, um, as well as a, an extension of like kind of post cyberpunk machine theory, um, as well as an, an introduction to this idea of responsibility and understanding of time and this contemporary condition. And you get some idea of the scale. So that machine, a you know, five-ton machine, it's, it's uh, 5.2 by 3.1 by 1,500 high, uh, sitting in a trench <coughs> with 150 cubic tons of earth was actually excavated from the site to, to place this work in. And I was really interested in, in appropriating that like 60s, 70s American earth art condition but introducing this contemporary condition of, of the digital data age and networking. Now with Parkfield itself, it's a very interesting location. It is central California. It's a tiny little town of, of 30 people. I spent six months living in this town. I spent close to 10 weeks installing. Um, the significance with Parkfield with seismology in the United 
US Geological Survey, it's the most densely monitored area on the globe. There's more instrumentation at 10 mile radius than anywhere else. So I was really interested in putting this machine in a location that was one, it was on central San Andreas Fault, and it was also significant in the field of the field, field sciences, of the geosciences in the United US Geological Survey. So it had significance, it was very pertinent to go to literally drop it in the centre of the field earth sciences globally. I'll just run through a few slides, so the excavation took place, and this, this was actually streamed live, so I was actually working remotely in this, in this field um, using a satellite internet access for six months. So just looking at here how this, actually this was streamed live, so you could actually look at the site remotely for that period of six months. Um, using, it was, it, was very, it was very DIY, this is actually using the same excavator that was used to, it was involved with the excavation, actually using it to lift the machine into the site. Um, the conditions were extreme, it was 40 to 45 degrees, it was the middle of summer, California. Um, and just a few uh, wide stills, um, you get some idea of the scale. And this ran autonomously for 91 days, it was un uninterrupted for 91 days. It would actually sleep at night. It shut down at 9.30 at night and then it would wake at 6.30 in the morning and replay events that occurred during the night. Now what was important to consider is there was actually three, three statuses of control. There was actually, it was, it was triggered by Californian only seismic events, 0 0.1 and above. And it was also triggered by sensors, <coughs> geophone sensors placed in the field. You could actually interact with it. So that photo there of me standing in front of the table, I'm actually stomping and the table's actually walking. And then the the third state of control was when there was no events, when there was no interactivity, human act interactivity, the table was creeping, like the San Andreas Fault does. It creeps two and a half inches north, so it was constantly moving. Now, it's a bit hard to see with this slide here because it's a bit dark, but attached to the table was an array of <coughs> 12 foot, 16 millimeter rods. Now, while the machine was running during those day hours, those rods were constantly resonant. So I was really interested in that reflecting this constant dynamic resonance of this dynamic planet that we inhabit. And now I just want to mention, I mentioned chance before, and we haven't had any events yet. We may get one, I hope we do. But 4th of July 2008, just it was very fitting. I was still installing, I decided I was gonna, I'd like to put the Star Spangled Banner on the table. And that came from the local fire station. So that was installed as a very Iwo Jima kind of like kind of scenario, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Central California, in the middle of nowhere with a shake table machine standing up, the American flag, uh, right in the middle of the Obama bush change. Two days later, a 30 foot dust devil came through and grabbed that flag <coughs> and threw it on the ground. I mean, huh, this is interesting. Like, and this is, I didn't go there to stand up the flag and have nature take it down. But I was very interested again about creating conditions about when you put things you put things together, you often get a collision and you get an outcome you don't expect. And here we get we get some idea of the scale. This 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 was actually a kite aerial photograph taken by a, a US ge geological survey uh, geologist Scott Heifner. Now I'm going to try and play just a little bit of video that just demonstrates what the table looks like.
audience in a remote central California, 200 miles south of San Francisco, 200 miles north of Los Angeles, there wasn't a lot of traffic. But it was interesting spending three months there and just with the self, you know, using local media, it was interesting the amount of audience actually came to visit this. I used to get people who would visit on weekends particularly who had heard about it and would actually come and look. And as I understand today, there's still people drive into Parkfield and go, where's that machine? Today in Parkfield there is, there is basically no evidence this work actually took place. Again, I was very interested in about how nature and geology and time, it's sort of just, it's, we have no trace except memory. Uh, a little bit technically, a um, photograph of me standing in a box, which was not much bigger than what I'm standing in, but I spent six months working out of this tiny little air-conditioned box with control gear. Um, the tape, you know, there's a bit of a schematic there. I won't detail the schematic of technically how the table worked. Um, what I will highlight, though, is some of this extraordinary talent that actually contributed software-wise to make this project happen, but one of the key leads was Dr. Andy Michael, US Geological Survey, geophysicist there. Um, Dr. Gio Homsey from the Bay Area, uh, who at the time worked remotely from New York. Um, Mr. Snow lives in Sydney from Laudanum.net. He worked remotely on it from Sydney and then stopped from Rotterdam, Holland. And what was, you know, I was actually spending the three months of uh, installing working remotely with these guys. So it was interesting how I'm in the middle of nowhere but working remotely with some extraordinarily talented individuals to make something very interesting happen. This is, I think this is, this is about a week after the machine was moved and the, the hole was repatriated. Um, this is actually a snapshot. This is Parkfield today as a Google screenshot. So Parkfield, so just some idea, 91 days between 4,000, 4,500 seismic events ran through that machine. Um, there were close to 43,000 know, JPEG frames disseminated from the site during that time. Again, it's interested about, interesting about this idea of engaging with time, engaging with a natural system by introducing a, a physical system to a natural system. Briefly, 2010, I attempted to take the shape table into downtown LA to demonstrate uh, this idea of social um, and community resilience about earthquake preparedness and awareness. Um, this involved taking the shape table and setting up a temporary disaster relief camp around the shape table for 10 days in downtown Los Angeles. Um, a year of negotiation, 10 days before I was to install, the city hit me with a $21,000 permit fee, which killed that project. Um, but out of that came a work which happened in Sydney, which is related but sort of unrelated, but it was a work at uh, on the grounds of Sydney University last April called Disaster Hotel, where I demonstrated some open, open, open hardware shelter systems, where I actually occupied this, these two dwellings for two weeks. In, Feb in April last year, and I invited guests to come and stay. So the guests had to come, come prepared. So it was just demonstrating social resilience and how the individual may need to respond in the, in the context of crisis. So demonstrating these very cheap, low-cost shelter systems which were built from materials that you can buy from Bunnings. And then we jumped early this year um, with the Alice Fair Research Facility. Um, and I just want to thank the Australia Council, the Music Board and InterArts for um, supporting my residency to take place there. It was an extraordinary experience. Um, a little bit about Alisphere, which Ricardo covered. Um, started by Joanne Kuchera Moran. Um, as I understand, she started thinking about this 20 years ago. Um, it was realised, they, they actually they got the sign off to start on about seven years ago, and only opened three years ago. And what it is, it's a, it's a 30 foot diameter sphere built into a three storey building. Um, it has a what we call a near anechoic chamber, it's almost soundproof. And it has a, a projection array, which actually today, at present, actually is a full array of visualization or visuals across the ceiling of it, and has three hemi hemispheres of sound. So you've got, and which you can actually you can map that sound to experience spatial audio. Um, some extraordinary work happens there. Some extraordinary um, people doing things there. Um, it comes under the banner of Media Arts and Technology, UC Santa Barbara. Um, some of the works that I saw there is they are, they are so, it's hard to tell, is it science, is it art? But to the left you can get a bit of an idea. It's the first work that took place, there was a work called Allo Brain, which was by Marcus Novak, but he actually scanned his brain and then actually created a, a visualisation of what it's like to travel through those brain and watch how brain cells respond with each other. And then the most recent work up on the right was a work called Artificial Nature, which was actually more art than science, but it's actually an abstraction of like virtual beings, creatures, which again respond with each other. 
And what Joanne's doing there, which is very interesting, is she's really interested in chasing things that we haven't seen. So when you hear stories about atmosphere, atmosphere being described as like you know, a 21st century telescope, so it is using this, this, this digital condition and, and algorithms to look for things that you don't see. So hence, it's associated with the Nano Systems Institute, UC Santa Barbara. And Joanne, Joanne's an extraordinary individual. As, as Ricardo said, she's a, she's a composer. She's not composing so much anymore, but she's very driven to, to sort of close this kind of bridge between the arts and the sciences and, and see what happens when they collide even more. So while I, while I was there, um, I decided to, uh, you know, of course I was interested in, in the seismic landscape. So how, two things, how could you, you know, and I was actually focused on two things. One was a study of the auditory display of seismic waveform data and a study of what tool, numerical modeling tools, the geosciences are using today to visualize this dynamic planet. <coughs> One of the highlights, and I've got to emphasise the highlights, is doing the residency, I, I, I worked with a, a, a brilliant young student, PhD student, called Ryan McGee from Texas, who has a background in electrical engineering. He's about 25 years old. And Joanne assigned him to work with me for this, this process. And we're still continuing to work today. So what I, what I did with Ryan is I spent a lot of time, to start with, just bringing him up to speed what the science, geosciences are doing with auditory display what they're doing with the visualization, and then I let them run for it. One thing I, one thing I did is I let, first thing I let them do, realizing he had an appreciation for electronica, was to actually make some electronica with some seismic waveform data. But at, well, at the same time, maintaining, maintaining the, the signature of that data and not move outside it. It's, it's actually pretty easy to make seismic data sound like dubstep, for example. So maintain its signature. So what, what, what I, what's important and what was very interesting to, to discover during the residency was getting a, a good understanding of the history, scientific history, of auditory display of seismic waveform data. Now it goes back to the early 60s when they discovered with analog tape that you, could, you can actually play this tape back. In the 70s, they actually, the sciences actually started using the, the, the tape and they would play them back in the morning and they would listen to events overnight. Then it wasn't until we went digital in 1992, a very significant... Um, paper turned up at ICAD which described how, how the science, geosciences could be using waveform data as a tool, as, a, as, a, as another dimension. So we, we're a very visual orientated species and so the idea of using sound, we can look for new patterns through sound. Now hopefully this little sample will work. We see in 1999, Andy Michael, who I mentioned, who actually who, who worked, collaborated with me on the Parkfield project, actually started doing some work with seismic waveform data and doing some with a, with a three piece of cello, vocals, and a, and a trombone. And he talked about this idea how effectively sound waves are very similar to seismic waves. Sound waves travel through air and attenuate through air, where seismic waves travel through the upper mantle with the crust. Same thing. So everything sort of hinges around this idea of the wave equation. And then 2001, the Europeans are way ahead of the curve all of a sudden. The Europeans are <coughs> working with auditory display um, of seismic data, and it actually comes again from a geophysicist who's actually today working in the arts, and he's actually been very interested in how the kind of the, the psychological um, capacity of, of taking natural data systems and turning into an audible, audible display and looking again for patterns of language and understanding of natural systems. And then we look at, I'm about to just play another sample of a work which Ryan McGee made with data collected from the Haiti earthquake of 2010.
had an earthquake. <laughs> um, and what's important to consider about that bit of sound, we're not actually listening to an earthquake, we're listening to data collected from an earthquake. What I did use the Allosphere for was a sound performance, which was based on taking data from large earthquakes this decade, this 21st century, and then mapping them spatially to the Allosphere, so you actually stood inside the, the Allosphere and you could actually hear the sound travelling and the sound of seismic data travelling around you, and not through you, but around you. And so what I wanted to ho highlight is again the, the similarity between sound waves and the similarities between seismic waves. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually just going to bring up a, a software package called Sonifier, which again comes from Florian Dombos in, in Europe. Um, and I'm actually going to play not the piece that was performed inside the Allosphere, which was a seven minute composition based on the seismic data and some 31 ET equal temperament, tonal equal temperament, which was to give a signifier between the events so you could attempt to understand this is a new event, it's not the same one. But I'm going to run this piece of software now, I'm just going to do a, a, a very simple, probably about 90 second scratch of large earthquakes this, this century. So what I was doing there, that was <clears throat> seismic waveform data which was effectively just being sped up because seismic events are infrasounds and so it was bringing it into the audible spectrum so they were ranging from speeding it up from, from uh, 200 times to basically 2000 times so it just brings it into that audible range of, of understanding. Now back on the allosphere, so that performance, being in a sphere, a circular sphere and standing in the middle of that ramp I was actually, the, the audio was spatially mapped, so I was actually coming from the direction the event was occurring. So if you were effectively standing in the centre of the Pacific and the centre of the globe, it was about experiencing what it might sound like if you could listen to seismic data standing beneath the surface of the Earth. Um, future work. Um, one thing's very dear to me, I mean, it's, it's halfway there, but Sounds of Seismic, which is a project which actually takes this data and then makes it public, it's continuous. And the idea is to build continuous uh, streams of data from different sensors and then building interface where the user can choose what sensors they would like to listen to, what channels of sound they would like to listen to. I'm very interested in this idea, it's an infinite work, it's continuous, it, it lasts, it doesn't stop. And I'm also very interested, we've promised to show that this that, that, uh, software like this has some use with the US Geological Survey as far as their outreach. So I envisage this potentially being seen uh, the, the sound files generated through this being published on a science site. And so I'm very interested in how the arts can actually attempt to have some interaction and effect within the sciences themselves. The other project, which is a bit of a shift, um, this is actually a concept that was actually put forward earlier this year for the ANET initiated uh, ecology project using 1 O'Connell Street as a, as, a, as, a, as a building to interface ecological based data sets. So 
there are a couple of components about what kind of data sets could be used in this building. One was obviously seismic data, but one in particular was uh, atmospheric lightning data. So we could actually listen to the sound of spherics while traveling in the lift shaft. Uh, there were also other components. There were some chimes, uh, interface with seismic data. There was some um, uh, in internal growth system. I was just very interested in this idea of engaging a, an architectural environment that people inhabit and occupy and work from and introducing like an e ecological data set to the system. Uh, this is a project which is going ahead in Los Angeles 24, early 2014. It's a, it's a work called uh, Terrasonus Domus, which is a little bit architecture, a little bit science, a little bit social resilience. And it's about, again, taking the principle of the shelter system used in Sydney last year and actually building a 20 foot four high uh, house. But the house is using very low cost materials, which sheet materials, eight by four sheets, which are then rendered with uh, a, a concrete aggregation. The idea that a structure like this will last 10 to 15 years. So I'm interested in demonstrating preparedness techniques of how a community may need to respond post-event, um, but then inside it bringing in a seismic data stream so it becomes an environment, a spatial environment that you actually visit and you sit in and you listen to the sound of the environment inside the building that you may use the techniques of how it was designed to live out of later. Again, another shift, which is Australia, something I'm working on is, a, is, a, is actually an earthwork in remote Western Australia, but it's effectively a drawing. It's, a, it's an etching where I'm very interested in this idea of taking, taking the, uh, the, basically the DNA of humanity and mapping it into a thumbprint and then engraving it in the remote Australian landscape like an etching, like a drawing, and literally just very, it's, it's subtle, it's performance-based, it won't last. In fact, something like this wouldn't last more than a couple of years before nature would just reclaim it. So I'm very interested about, in this kind of idea about how we have, we have input and we have uh, effect within our natural system that we inhabit, but it's replenishing, it renews. Which leads me to ask, which I think I just want to put forward some ideas briefly about, you know, what is art? in this early 21st century. Um, and there's something I'd like to just highlight, and these are shifts which we're seeing in the United States and we are seeing in Europe, um, this idea, and what is a media artist? Well, I, I liken myself to being a media artist, but I'm probably more of a critical engineer. I'm interested in critiquing how systems work, um, how technology works, and ways of using technology. Um, I think what's really important to highlight with contemporary practice, and social practice itself, is reward patience. When we think about economic system, we're all driven by quarter returns. Well, what happens when we get driven by decade returns? What kind of results, what kind of effects do we have when we start to slow things down and start to think like that? Um, citizen science is going to play a major role in, in the sciences in the next decade. And critical engineers, media artists, will probably have a great impact and role in changing that. Um, and it's very important to note, everyone's probably very aware of what's happened recently in Italy with some geophysicists being found guilty of manslaughter because they couldn't predict an earthquake, which is the holy grail. Um, we probably won't see earthquake prediction in our time, but what we will see is we'll see citizens can put their hand up and say, I think there might be an event, and it negates the institutional framework of an institution like the geosciences in Italy getting themselves into sorts of trouble. So you can see how the citizen can put their hand up more. It opens doors. Um, responsibility. Responsibility not only as individuals, but responsibility is about culture making. What is culture? What does it look like? What sort of effects should it have in society? Um, sustainability, again, ecologically, culturally, um, and I liken the idea that this kind of field, it's also resistance. It res it's resistance to the speed and the rapid growth that our contemporary society is moving at. And I hope you're all prepared. <laughs> That was extraordinary, and you know we'll be able to go to your website as well. But there might be some questions from the from the, the crowd at the moment. If you can't think of them now immediately, you can email DB some questions at all shook up. DB at all shook up at all shook up. Com. And just so you do know, those that, those two signs that was a, a 1.7 event in southern Alaska and a one magnitude one in northern California. Thank you. And so just a, some questions. I know Andy had a question. Oh, I think you've already answered this, Stevie, but um, let me ask you again anyway, just mm -hmm. to see if you have anything else to say. Is, is this music? No, it's not music. It's, it's sound. It's sound. 
Um, and I'm particularly interested in um, it may become music once we start seeing patterns that emerge from when you take large data sets like this and then process it, um, what kind of music does come out of it. And then the other thing is about what, kind, what the co composer could bring to these tools, what kind of music could emerge from it. But effectively, I'm not, I'm, with this work, it's not about making music to, to a large degree. It's, of course, it's art. It comes under the banner of art. Well, I think it does, but it's, it's seeking for, to create tools and language and actions and interventions which speak about broader, broader issues. And as we're seeing this emergence of, of art crossing over, so hence we see the, the activism that's emerging in, in contemporary practice now. Now I've got a question there. I mean, in terms of the sonification of that data, is, that, is, there, is there stuff that the geoscientists are learning from that at, now, it, or is that sort of something that's Good question. Now, look, look the, it's, the, they've been aware of it for almost three decades. Um, interesting, it's the same again. We're such a visual orientated species, um, they've actually been, they're not exploring it. It's actually a field which is still yet to be explored. And so I can see great effect how. With taking data sets and then sonifying and autifying it, what kind of patterns can be emerging? Now, when they, when they first started working with it, they viewed it as an extra, and they call it auditory display, but it's an extra tool. So I can be using a display, but I can be listening at the same time. Again, I'm, I'm multifunctional. So it's about, and, but then interestingly, they're using it a lot in, in mining. So when they set up small geophone arrays, is that they're actually listening rather than looking, so they can do different tasks at the same time. That part will display. Yes. And you're jumping up and down, you can see the, uh, the deck moving. Yep. I'm wondering what the scale was, for instance, if uh, you were jumping up and down to figure the magnitude uh, of the earthquake, how much bigger would it have moved to? Sure, actually, that, that table itself, um, under full power, over that surface area, it's about a magnitude five and a half to six. When I'm jumping with it, it's about three. And interesting, with seismic events, earthquakes, you don't actually feel seismic events until about magnitude three. And even then, you'd want to be within 10 miles of it. And it's interesting to point out there are estimated between three to four million seismic events occur globally every year, and about half a million to a million are detected. So this planet is constantly resonant. And I also got to highlight as I'm standing and you're sitting, you're actually spinning at 1,200 kilometres an hour. There's something to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I read the other day that in Italy uh, some seismologists were uh, sent to jail because they weren't able to uh, uh, foresee the, 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 the earthquake that happened two years ago. So I was wondering how quick is for a seismologist or a geologist to realize, oh, there's going to be an earthquake in the next in the next ten minutes or now? How how accurate and how uh, what is the time that that have scientists to Notify the, the population, hey, we sure. have an earthquake. How is that possible? That's a good question. Um, and I must hold out those Italian seismologists and geophysicists, they haven't been sent to prison yet. Uh, okay. right? So it's in an appeal process. I would hope we'll probably get overturned. Um, but your question about earthquake prediction now, geophysicists like long term forecasting, they know where earthquakes happen, what areas they happen in, and the likelihood, like, for example, so, you know, New Zealand, we know you're going to get a big event there at some point, don't know when. Same with Northern California, Southern California, but anywhere on that continental, you know, the ring of fire effectively, we know there are seismic events. As far as actually predicting, um, as I understand and as I've been told, it probably won't be in our time. That will be computational processing, it will probably come through distributed computing, it will probably come through something like smartphone devices. And they actually have some, an early warning system in Tokyo. So that, that event early this year, that was, and it's actually used in schools. And so what happens, that was a Northern California, so Northern Japanese seismic event, a very large one, that actually gave schools in Tokyo 20 to 30 seconds warning because it had actually happened 400 miles north. Digital data network was able to disseminate down there faster than that waves are traveling to say, take cover. So that's about as good as it gets. We, all we have is a, a warning system to say, drop cover, hold on. As far as prediction, to be able to say there is going to be a major seismic event in this location at this time, um, that is the holy grail. In fact, it's probably one of the most holy grails of this contemporary sciences. It's, many will say it's not possible. In fact, in the 80s, many geophysicists lost careers over trying to pursue it. Why is it so hard to, uh, to, to understand? I mean, we saw that there's the weather. Okay, well, we'll probably see, we'll, we'll probably see science, climate scientists being jailed for manslaughter for not predicting flooding yeah. in the near future. 
Now, that's a good question. Why, why can't they predict it? We don't have enough data. We don't, you know, when you think of this planetary system that we inhabit, it's 4.6 billion years old. We have, we have numerical data less than, you know, 50, well, numerically we're about 30 years old. Um, I think you probably find in a couple of hundred years we may, we may start to see some results about data, if we're still here, if we're still here. And one thing I want to highlight, when we think of earthquakes, you think of earthquakes, you know, they're, they're big events, you know, they fuck things up badly, big events do. Um, and I want to highlight, I'm not about working with these, these you know, catastrophic events, natural events. I'm really interested in the, in the resonance. And it's something I want to, you know, growing up in New Zealand and growing up with earthquakes, the Australian cultural psyche is quite different to and California in the sense that we don't live with seismic resonance. We're not living with this constant, like, geez, this, this could happen at any time. And it's actually a different cultural context, too, about you're constantly, effectively on your toes, this could happen at any time. And I believe it actually has effect on how this social, you know, Australia's effectively very mellow and laid back. And I'm pretty sure that it has some effect. Maybe when the fracking starts, we might become a bit more tense. <laughs> It's unprocessed. There's no, there's no, there's no um, synthesis involved. All I'm doing is just speeding and slowing the data up. In fact, we're speeding it up and we're running at different speeds. So it's very, it's, it's what I call very pure. Like there is, there is no granular synthesis involved or anything like that. Though it can be applied. Once you start doing that, it starts to sound, um, it starts to sound like 80s, early 90s kind of computer-generated sound. <laughs> Which is okay by me. <laughs> Maybe I should be making dubstep. <laughs> so there's kind of a very rhythmic heartbeat kind of to oh, those sounds. Sure. Very sure. moving. Well, I think it's something important to consider that, you know, like, you know, like us, you know, we are these micro systems inhabiting a larger system, and there's just seven billion of us. But we are inherently, and I'm pretty sure you'll find this is something really interesting about Joanne, is she's very fascinated about the future. You know, in fact, you know, this probably shouldn't be recorded, but Joanne believes we are actually holograms. Right? We are actually holograms. Right? We're not actually here. So there you go. But I, one other thing I want to encourage is I think <laughs> that um, it would be great to see you continue with the Allosphere Initiative and throw someone else in there. I think you'll, you'll get some extraordinary results again about not necessarily um, product or production itself, but uh, new ways of thinking, new collaborations, new interpretations of how to approach what is art in this early 21st century. One, uh, maybe question from the floor. I'd like right of darkness when you appeared on your screen. What is that capturing? Oh, what this, this is actually just a, a Python script which is actually passing a global event list. So what we're seeing there is this last two events, that when the siren ran twice, the one point, yeah, 1.0 and 1 1.1. Uh, but these are just these are actually global three and a half and US one and a half. So the siren recorded and actually they were two events. Two events that happened as we were sitting here. Sure, yeah. And I've turned it off so we um, we won't get any more. You're safe. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you came to this from a science background or from a musical background. Uh, this particular work, I mean, like well, Alice. Well, I guess your life's work, which seems to be. A um, interesting. Look, I come from a um, I come from a media arts degree from College of Fine Arts. The Parkfield project was a uh, research master's degree performance installation. Um, the sciences, I'm not sure. I think I've been very, you know, and actually early 90s, you know, I was doing a lot of performance actions in Sydney and then machine performances and collaborations. I've always been, and I guess recently in the last five years, particularly with the Parkfield project, when I started to you know, watch, you know, spending three months living with a five ton machine, watching the frequency of this dynamic planet physically and visually, um, as physical mass, not a projection or not a sound, I started to realise, wow, there's, there's more going on here than I realise. And I think through maturity, I'm just very interested in now and in exploring new ways of interpretation, new ways of, of outreach and dissemination, new ways of effect. Um, and I'm very interested in, in the way that the sciences and the arts have been, I, I don't like the word converging, but they call it that convergence between the two. But I think we're probably heading in a direction where we're probably going to see new forms appearing in the very near future. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk about what is art in this, you know, this early 21st condition. It's getting pretty weird. I don't know what it is. 
Um, and I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in being involved with models which demonstrate, which become like kind of time capsules to the future, so future generations. So I like, and we potentially could be sitting on the cusp of another renaissance like we saw in the 1700s. But I think that's probably where it's heading. And so there's a lot of movement in the US and in Europe within the cultural sector to go, let's, let's do it. And I think the interesting thing about, as, as, we, as, as we've been immune from the financial crisis globally in Australia, but in the US and particularly, it's kind of an open slate. It's not, you know, they're very, you know we're very lucky, blessed to have this institution here. There is no funding. And so what happens is it's kind of caution to the wind. It's just, it just goes for it and it's very crowdsource driven. So people, I don't know if that model will work here because we don't have the critical mass for crowdsourcing, but I think the future is, is you know, as ominous as it may look and it may sound, I think it has enormous potential for culture to have great effect. So we, when I mentioned resistance, effectively that's what we are. We are the resistance to this, this machine as it, as it goes faster and, and quicker and consumes. And, Questions? Well, please just hands together again for the Come asking some questions or interact with you while he's here today. Right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.